Good afternoon, all, and welcome to the Politics of Higher Education series. We'll give people a few more moments to join, and then we will get started. Good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for the Politics of Higher Education series. This is brought to you by the Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement, as well as the Eagleston Institute of Politics. I'm Melissa Wooten, the Associate Vice President for Academic Equity within the Division, Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. And we've organized this series so that we can bring attention to and build community around the ways in which politics and political decision making affect higher education, but especially efforts in higher education that are related to diversifying and creating a more inclusive college campus. We're thrilled today to have our speakers, uh, Laura Hamilton and Kelly, News um, Kelly Nielsen, who are here to talk to us about their latest research. And so while we have you here, we also wanted to advertise an upcoming event, um, our Equity Mindset Series. We'll be bringing Dr. Mysir Kills here, who will be talking about stepping outside the diversity box and helping us to think about the multiple dimensions of inclusion that our students face and what that means for us as faculty and staff who work with them. Uh, you can register for that event at go.ruckers.edu slash mindset. Our speakers today are Laura Hamilton and Kelly Nelson. Laura Hamilton is a professor of sociology at the University of California, Merced. Broadly, her research interests include higher education, organizations, social class, gender, intersectionality, family, and mixed methods research. She's the author of Parenting to a Degree, How Family Matters for College and co-author of Paying for the Party, how College Maintains Inequality and Beyond, as well as Broke, the Racial Consequences of Underfunding Public Universities. Kelly Nielsen is a Senior Research Analyst at the Center for Research and Evaluation at UC San Diego Extension. Broadly, his scholarship focuses on the student experiences in higher education and organizational sources of inequality and equity. He's the co-author of Broke, The Racial Consequences of Underfunding Public Universities, and has published his research in the journals of Sociology of Education, Theory and Society, Social Problems, Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, and the Journal of Classical Sociology. Their presentation will be about 30 to 40 minutes, and after that, we'll take questions from participants. You can add questions to the Q&A or to the chat. Thank you, and we're looking forward to their talk. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So we are really thrilled to be here today. Um, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Melissa Wooten and the Edu Educational Equity Group in the Division of Community Engagement for inviting us to this space and for the opportunity to learn more about your campus. Recently, we published Broke, uh, The Racial Consequences of Underfunding Public Universities. Our goal today is to first share some of the top line insights and findings from our book. In particular, we want to discuss the experiences of two University of California campuses, Merced, where I'm currently at, and Riverside, and becoming racially and socioeconomically diverse research universities in a stratified and racially segregated higher education system. We're then going to discuss what Broke can tell us about Rutgers in this moment, as the school looks to intentionally diversify its student body. What can the university do to support this transition? And what are some potential hurdles or barriers? Our book is fundamentally about the racial stratification of students and resources in higher education. To explain the racial hierarchies that structure the US post-secondary system today and how a school like Rutgers fits into the picture, we're going to need to do a quick, very quick dive into history. For most of the 20th century, families of color as part of the tax base were paying for wealthy white students to attend universities where their own offspring were not welcome. Everything changed as marginalized populations gained more access to historically white organizations. 
affluent whites would need to pay to help pay for the post-secondary education of students of color, as well as the white working class. This did not happen. Instead, over the next 30 years, starting in the early 1970s, the dismantling of what scholars have referred to as the state university partnership occurred. The federal and state investments that had built a phenomenal post-secondary infrastructure were basically systematically dismantled. Funding decreased as state governments made different choices about where to invest. This graph captures what happened in California, and this trend is not, uh, this is not at all isolated to California. You can see that four-year public university funding and funding for corrections in the state of California move in opposite directions. Higher education funding sharply declines as corrections funding increases over time. The decline in funding occurs alongside the death of racial affirmative action in higher education. Indeed, the states that would adopt bans on affirmative action were those with a decline in the percentage of white students at flagship universities. That is to say, when a mechanism for the racial dominance of whites was threatened, states responded aggressively through their budgets and their courts. Alongside these trends, there have been major changes in the racial composition of the college going population. And I mean, very major trends. As a percentage of the college going population, the white demographic has decreased by 34.5% since 1976. 19.5% of the college population is now Latinx, which is a 441.7% increase since 1976. This is a massive change. In addition, 9.6% of the college going population is Black now. This is a 39.6% increase since 1976. We argue that without redistributive mechanisms, the new forms of segregation really accompanied this groundswell. And you can see here a picture of students at UC Merced, and this is a very representative picture of the student body. Um, most students who are racially marginalized students of color don't attend a school like UC Merced. Uh, they tend to attend low resource community colleges or predatory for profit universities. Tiny numbers who are predominantly from more affluent families land at elite privates. But when you do see racially marginalized students attending research universities, especially those from low income families, they do so at universities that mostly enroll other students like themselves. Many of these schools are publicly recognized as minority serving institutions. For instance, both UC Merced and UC Riverside, who are the subject of Broke, are Hispanic serving institutions or HSIs. But what I want to emphasize is that with the except, exception of HBCUs, which are historically black colleges and universities, as well as tribal colleges, most minority serving institutions are not founded to serve racially marginalized populations. Instead, they often start predominantly white and they go through a conversion process from a predominantly white student body to a predominantly racialized student, racially marginalized student body as the composition of the student body shifts. And then the MSI designations then are based entirely on the percentage of students who meet particular demographic qualifications. So what we still have uh, more than half a century after Brown versus Board of Education is an incredibly racially segregated post-secondary system. Racially marginalized students have more access to higher education than in the past, but they disproportionately attend schools with other racially marginalized students and not with their affluent white or East Asian and East Asian American peers. For instance, although HSIs comprise around 18% of the post-secondary sector, these schools educate over two thirds of all Latinx students. Anyway, hand the okay. digital mic to you, Kelly. Yeah, okay. So um, before we get into why higher education is still so segregated, um, Laura, we have a bit of an issue with our slides, it looks like. They're not fully 
um, showing up. Do we have, um, Dr. Wooten asked if um, you're in presenter view. Presenter view, hold on just a second. Let me stop my share and go to view. Sorry about that, everybody. So it's not visible? Uh, it's just not completely visible. So the slides are cut off at the bottom, at least that's- Oh, I know why that's going on. Here, give me one minute. Is it better now? That looks better, yeah. All right, I know what was going on. Sorry about that for the viewing audience. Great, okay, thanks. Um, so why is higher education still so segregated? And what are some of the implications for resources both across the higher education sort of sector broadly and, and within particular organizations? In Broke, we point to a neoliberal cycle of resource distribution. So what do we mean by that? Neoliberalism is a moral and economic ideology, a set of policies and practices and really a broader social imaginary that supports the deflation of public spending on social welfare and the intensification of private market competition. It rests on the colorblind belief that individuals and organizations should earn their financial rewards in a competitive marketplace. Yet colorblind beliefs do not take into account the continuing centrality of race to accessing opportunities and resources. In the US, wealth and income are racialized so that they are heavily concentrated among white, but also East Asian and East Asian American families with while Latinx, black and indigenous families have been denied opportunities to build wealth over generations. So when these unequal resources are not redistributed racially um, to racially marginalized individuals and families, as well as the organizations that serve them, then they're harmed. So for example, dependence on relatively disadvantaged customers meant that black owned banks, for instance, were less able to invest in accrued profits. White banks work together to ensure liquidity during crises, but these organizations refuse to lend to black banks. Today, black banks still have less access to capital and are more likely to fail. As we will show, universities that serve racially and economically marginalized groups face some similar hurdles. In the US higher education system, racialized resource allocation is centered on merit, a socially constructed and colorblind sorting mechanism that emerged in elite US higher education as a defense against demands for greater access by marginalized groups. White families have, on average, greater income and wealth to devote to producing academic and extracurricular merit. Merit can be considered a form of laundering privilege. That is, it takes structural advantages available to some families, but not others, and then obscures those privileges, couching student achievements in terms of individual talent, intelligence, and success. So it's kind of like taking money from off the books financial activities, funneling it through a legitimate business, and then claiming that business is wildly successful. Merit is produced through privilege. It's not the case that children from wealthier, racially advantaged families are somehow better or more capable. Merit leads to the sorting of students from different racial groups into different schools. So merit is also mapped onto organizations so that there are supposedly more selective and better quality schools, distinctions that are directly tied to student racial composition. In particular, and as many of you are aware, the schools at the top of the hierarchy, according to the US News and World Report, tend to have very few Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Southeast Asian and other racially underrepresented students. The schools on this slide are also private, but if you keep going down the list, you arrive at public universities that also have limited representation of these particular populations. 
Public schools with more advantaged student bodies have offset public funding declines with increases in out-of-state and international students who pay much higher tuition. They are more likely to have substantial endowments and receive large donations, often from advantaged alumni who are well positioned to donate back to the institution. With few exceptions, multi-million dollar gifts to schools with more advantaged populations, or they go to these schools. Schools that serve racially and economically disadvantaged students are less competitive for private funds from tuition, donations, philanthropic investment, and corporations. With limited access to private funds, these organizations cannot provide the same level of support as organizations serving affluent white students. So for instance, Merced and Riverside's budgets are almost entirely dependent on the state funds that they receive. They have tiny, almost non-existent, non-resident student populations, and thus cannot rely on the additional tuition boost these students bring. They have no million dollar pop donor pipeline. Indeed, Merced's foundation receives less than 1% of the private support that Berkeley's foundation takes in during the given year. Auxiliary services that often make money at other schools drain their coffers. Merced and Riverside are doing the work that public research universities were envisioned to be doing. That is, they bring opportunities to families and regions in need of support. They're working with students whose potential is untapped, students who are tied to impoverished and often forgotten inland areas of the state of California, whose families harvest our nation's produce and fill low paid essential worker positions during the global pandemic. Yet they do it with a fraction of the funds available to other UCs, much less the elite private universities in the state. Without greater state investment, universities that work with marginalized student populations are often literally starved for resources. In fact, as one administrator somewhat crudely put it, UC Merced is already the leanest machine that exists in the public higher ed world. We can't get any leaner without being diagnosed with an eating disorder. This pattern is not just restricted to the UC system or California. University wealth is nationally concentrated at schools that serve very few numbers of marginalized students. The gaps by student race are in fact larger than the gaps by student class. On the next slide, let me provide an illustration using national data. This graph displays endowment dollars per student by student race at four-year publics. In the mid-1980s, the endowment dollars per student were very similar regardless of student race. But over time, as post-secondary schools came to rely more and more on private funding sources, disparities sharpened, such that Asian and white students are located at resource-rich schools, and Latinx, Black, and Native American students are enrolled in schools where there are fewer endowment dollars per student. National data from the Institute for College Access and Success indicate that even setting aside endowment dollars, schools that are at least 40% Latinx or 40% Black face persistent resource disparities and declines in per student state appropriations. In 2018-19, Predominantly Latinx institutions had nearly $4,300 less in per student revenue than schools located in the same states. From 2006 to 2018, per student state and local appropriations at these schools declined by almost $1,000. Similar to other public four-year colleges, predominantly Latinx schools offset reduced per student funding with increases in tuition revenue. Yet gaps in total revenue between these schools and all public four-year schools have widened. So in 2018, 2019, HBCUs and predominantly black institutions received about $1,500 less in per student revenue than their peers. The burden of paying for college increased dramatically for students at HBCUs and predominantly black institutions, as these schools compensated for funding cuts and slow reinvestment after the Great Recession. Since 2006, per student tuition and fee revenue increased at these schools by 65% in current dollars, or more than double the rate of inflation. Resource inequities matter. 
Post-secondary resources are things like a low faculty to student ratio, the presence of supportive infrastructure like cultural centers, a large number of academic and social advisors, programming geared toward first-generation students, etc. Provision of these resources support student experiences, graduation, and transitions to employment and graduate school. When there's not enough state money to fund even basic resources, schools either don't provide them or they find ways to extract this money from students via tuition, fees, and pay services. Racially and economically marginalized student populations can thus get financially penalized for the very racial inequities that lead their institutions to come up short in the first place. Employees at resource-starved universities often have clear-eyed goals about supporting students that run into hard fiscal realities. It's sort of hard to imagine unless you are at a similar institution. So let me share a quote from a passionate university representative at a vigorous town hall at UC Riverside in 2016. A world-class university is not one in which new students arrive without housing accommodations, face panic with course registrations and financial aid, or attempt to get appointments with overburdened advisors and staff. It is not one in which students come to class stressed out because they've spent an hour or more trying to find parking. And it is not one in which students avoid the restrooms, if at all possible, because they are, in my students' words, disgusting. Only then to go into classrooms with broken furniture, missing ceiling tiles, dust encrusted air vents, wires coming out of walls, floors covered with dirty footprints and leaves, and filthy desks and chairs. They have to contend with unstable Wi-Fi access because the system is overburdened and several student centers are overwhelmed. The message students get is that once they have contributed to UC Riverside being named a Hispanic serving institution and recognized as one of the most diverse campuses in the nation, is that it is then unimportant that they, at a minimum, receive instruction in adequately appointed labs, classrooms, and lecture halls. This is not world class, it is third class. The situation at Merced, our other case site for Broke, was very similar and more pronounced in some ways. Although the physical infrastructure there is new and not yet crumbling, the campus has struggled to provide basic services to students. For instance, the chapter, Tolerable Suboptimization, is in fact named after a policy put into effect at Merced in 2016. During the workforce planning process, Leadership produced a webcast about tolerable suboptimization. Staff members around the university were asked to pause their work, tune in, and submit questions, which were answered live and also in a document that was then circulated after the webcast. Given concerns about budget cuts and potential layoffs, the webcast was widely and anxiously viewed. During the webcast, the ABC indicated that workers should practice tolerable suboptimization. And he defined the term as follows. Absent an allocation of X resources, then we must accept Y level of suboptimization. Now, examples of tolerable suboptimization included making faculty wait longer for their travel expenditure reimbursements or extending the time it takes to categorize new positions for hire. As the ABC noted, the long range budget model only allowed for funding about a third of the requested staff positions identified during the workforce planning process. But as he noted, we must live within our means. Consequently, he determined that the university must accept a standard of output that may not be ideal, but is necessary so that we do not overwork and overtax our valued staff. However, as he warned multiple times, Tolerable suboptimization is not an invitation or permission to abandon responsibilities. He said, I personally abhor uncorrected underperformance and find it intolerable. Offering suboptimal supports for students was thus actually university policy, and it was tone deaf policy as staff had been running on empty to do their jobs because many cared deeply about their students. 
the lack of staffing had real consequences for students. This figure shows that in every school at UC Merced, there was a shortage of advisors relative to the national average at a public doctoral university. The other point I will note is that the lack of staff was most acute in parts of the university where there were concentrations of marginalized students. For instance, the School of Social Sciences, Humanities and Arts, or Shaw as it's called, disproportionately served Black and Latinx students. The average caseload for academic advisors in Shaw was 740 students per advisor. Now this is roughly two and a half times the national median for advisors at similar schools. The caseload for advisors in the engineering school or ES in contrast was around 300 for full-time advisors. School-based racial inequities and in access to advising internal to the campus were therefore substantial. Students shared heart-wrenching accounts about making critical mistakes due to a lack of access to advisors. They would wait in lines, snaking around the hallway for five minutes with an advisor. Many had to see peer advisors instead of real advisors. This was tolerable sub-optimization, and it is not tolerable, especially for students who depend on the university for guidance. When universities that serve disadvantaged groups at high rates lack resources, then they may struggle to produce the kinds of outcomes that create the appearance of merit. And thus the neoliberal cycle of resource allocation begins all over again. These kinds of disparities are deeply troubling and are only likely to get worse if public funding continues to dry up and campuses continue to rely on competition for private resources. Competitions in which universities serving disadvantaged student populations are poorly positioned. So we're gonna switch gears now and focus on Rutgers. What are the lessons that we can glean for this campus and the larger Rutgers system? What can be done to stop the racial neoliberal cycle of resource allocation from playing out here? The Rutgers New Brunswick, New Brunswick campus is in transition. It is just over a third white, so the white majority is declining, and there are fairly substantial Asian and Latinx populations and a black population that should be growing. The school looks like one possible future is to become what we refer to as a new university. Most of the four year research schools that come to serve racially marginalized students actually start out as predominantly white institutions or PWIs that transition to the new university. New universities pair high research ambitions with predominantly disadvantaged student populations. Now, new universities are not at all new in the temporal sense. To the contrary, these are typically existing public universities. Some of them are quite old that have begun shifting their organizational practices and priorities often in response to post-secondary defunding, and sometimes in response to state legislatures that want to see public institutions serving the changing demographic population of the state. One major shift, often necessary for survival, is enrolling greater numbers of racially and or economically marginalized youth. Here you can see some basic features of new universities who are serving new populations. Typically, greater than a quarter of the student body identifies as racially underrepresented students, which we refer to as URS for shorthand, and greater than a third of the body is Pell Grant eligible. The school is top 200, according to the US News, and is perceived widely as a research university. Notably, historical analogs are HBCUs and the predominantly white land-grant university of the mid 20th century, as these are the institutions that previously enrolled large numbers of excluded individuals into top-notch research programs. There are new universities all over the country, including in the Rutgers system. They will increase in number as the racial demography of the US continues to change 
the wealth gap between the richest and poorest Americans grows, and declining fertility rates shrink the size of the college-going population. Basically, there will be fewer advantaged domestic or international students to enroll, and more schools will be or are doing what Rutgers is planning to do. Rutgers has announced efforts to enroll more low-income and first-generation students and those from historically underrepresented groups. The Garden State guarantee of two free years of tuition and fee-free tuition at one of New Jersey's four-year public institutions for students with an annual gross income of $65,000 or less will bring more of these students to the campus. Our work allowed us to focus in on what makes for successful, tra successful transitions away from being predominantly white institutions to more racially diverse universities. And some of these lessons speak to breaking the racial neoliberal resource allocation cycle, tackling racialized assumptions about which students and schools are quality and deserving of resources. First, the institution should not let the state off the hook uh, with unfunded mandates to increase the enrollment of low-income students who are also more likely to be racially marginalized without more state resources. One thing we have found is that over time, administrators have come to assume that the state won't be supportive and that private resources through grants, foundations, wealthy alumni, et cetera, are the only place to turn. Increased reliance on tuition encourages administrators to grow their campuses, putting strain on services that do not grow at the same pace. The institution can put pressure back on the state by highlighting the racial and class inequities inherent in asking the university to serve a new student population without the levels of support that were once offered to a more advantaged population. The university should also work to remind the state legislature and state residents what Rutgers means to New Jersey, all of the many ways that state taxpayers benefit from the university system thriving. The goal here, of course, is to remind the public that this is a public resource worthy of public investment. The university should also argue that the quality of universities should not be determined by who they serve, and the advantages that these students may bring with them to the campus, but by the value added to the lives of students and to the lives of those in the region and the state by the university. Part of this is pushing back against metrics like average SAT score that say nothing about what the school offers to its students. Also, this message is lost if just one school transmits this and that school will likely take a reputational hit. But forming consortiums of schools working on the same messaging can work. For example, the University Innovation Alliance is a coalition of public research universities that is committed to increasing the number and diversity of college graduates in the US. This group frames itself as public universities with a public mission and it views enrolling and graduating students from racially and economically marginalized backgrounds as central to its mission. Working in a political bloc helps to really challenge predominant framings around merit as the way to access university quality or assess university quality or student quality. Universities also need to work on an internal cultural transition. Faculty in particular, need to shift frameworks for understanding new, stu new student populations. Often faculty approach marginalized students with deficit frameworks, viewing them only through the lens of what they might lack rather than what these students actually bring to the classroom and how to leverage it. Faculty may be structuring classes in ways that work for advantaged students and fit the kinds of resources that advantaged students tend to possess rather than understanding the resources that marginalized students tend to bring with them to the classroom and working to leverage these strengths. Making this cultural transition is essential. It is also possible that some marginalized students will need more help from faculty. As UC Riverside transitioned to become a new university, the culture of the campus changed to embrace serving marginalized students as part of its organizational identity. 
This leads to our next point. Institutional actors need to recognize that it is inappropriate and damaging to rely on family resources to support their students. When serving primarily advantaged populations, this reliance is made sort of invisible. Universities draw down parental financial resources, as well as use parental social connections, and also sometimes not parents, but larger familial knowledge about how to navigate college. And then they report positive student outcomes, such as graduation, entry into graduate school, and employment in solid jobs as accomplishments of the university. Schools need to think intentionally about what the university can offer its students rather than outsourcing student supports to families. This means ensuring that sufficient advising, mental health and financial services are in place and that students know how to access them and making sure that staff have experience working with students of color and with low income students. The university should allocate more resources to group-based cultural centers and resist the pressure to cut costs with a single multicultural center. In our work, we found that the presence of a network of staffed cultural centers was vital to the university's ability to retain and support racially marginalized students. Cultural centers played a critical role in building and maintaining relationships with the communities that students come from, which is important for their success. Centers also limit the extent to which the labor of making campus safe and welcoming for racially marginalized students is outsourced to students and faculty. When campuses fail to proactively invest in center infrastructure, they often end up doing it retroactively after students are subject to a particular negative event or set of events and publicly demand support from their university. Rather than waiting for this to predictably occur, Rutgers can bolster exempting existing centers and expand the cultural center infrastructure. Of vital importance is also transforming the faculty, staff, and administration to match the changing student population. Predominantly white spaces are not just about student composition. They can remain predominantly white if university employees and leaders do not reflect the campus community. But hiring faculty and leadership of color, especially women of color, is not enough. These faculty will do heavy lifting in supporting the changing student population and should also have their service recognized and compensated. Universities should also be vigilant for and work against segregation and corresponding resource inequities internal to the university like those that we showed, we showed between Shaw and ES in UC Merced. Universities can create problematic racial resource disparities across units or schools when there is racial or class segregation in majors, housing, or utilize, utilization of campus services and pockets that, that serve these students are denied sufficient funding. How money flows within a university is a political statement and a political project. Universities should examine, for instance, how many credit hour dollars go to students in particular schools, and what is the racial composition of the school relative to the overall population of the campus? What is the advisor access for a student in a predominantly white or East Asian business program versus a predominantly racialized, mar racially marginalized ethnic studies program? These are important questions to ask, especially in resource scarce environments as cuts tend to be made in units or areas that matter most for vulnerable student groups. In contrast, resources tend to be preserved wherever there are vocal and powerful advantaged student groups and parents involved. The university really needs to think critically about police, both university police and outside police. Racially marginalized students are more likely to be targets of racialized harassment as their white peers on campus will call the police on them. They are more likely to experience police violence on and off campus. At UC Merced, for instance, a student of color was shot and killed at a distance by campus police, even though he was only armed with a knife. Campus police need training. There needs to be a community board to which police answer and which helps to determine police policy 
Policies about outside police from the city need to be in place. For example, at UC Riverside, outside police were called in during a student protest in 2012, and the campus had no control over the way that the protest was handled. The conflict between the local sheriff's department and student protesters damaged whatever positive relationship had been established between campus police and students. In short, the campus needs to be aware of the vulnerabilities of the shifting population and the likely dynamics that will result with police. And finally, don't forget sister campuses. It is important to work together as a system and share resources as well as political challenges rather than competing for scraps. A racially segregated state system is a problem. Already the Newark and Camden campuses have a substantially larger black student population and the Newark campus has a much larger Latinx population. Resources need to flow to the racially and economically marginalized populations of the state and working together across campuses makes this more likely to occur. For example, we could point to the One U campaign in the Michigan system. In Michigan, the One University Coalition has contended that the Dearborn and Flint campuses serve a disproportionately large share of racially marginalized students from within the state, Black and low-income students in particular, but they only receive a tiny portion of the financial resources available to the flagship Ann Arbor campus. They are arguing for greater equity across campuses, which requires all campuses to think about the larger interests of students in the state. These suggestions are intended to break the racial neoliberal cycle of resource allocation. They work against devaluing low-income students of color and the institutions these students, these students attend. The goal is to shake up the institutional hierarchies that are based on race and to allocate private and public resources more equitably. As a result, we are aiming for more substantial organizational supports for racially and economically marginalized students breaking this vicious cycle. Thank you. We are excited to take any questions or comments. I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share right now. Thank you so much for um, that presentation. And uh, thank you especially for tailoring some parts of it to our Rutgers uh, community. And so we will go ahead now and open it up to question and answer. Um, attendees, please feel free to add questions to the Q&A or to the chat. I will do my best to monitor both spaces. Um, but I have some questions um, to help get us started. I'm going to just go ahead and throw out um, three questions that I have for you. The first was about the endowment figures. Um, and so that was um, a pretty drastic shift in terms of where we started and sort of where we are now endowments by race. And so one of the questions or the question about that that I have is just sort of what's driving that. Is that because different institutions ended up serving different types of students? And so just trying to get a sense for what is actually driving that. The second question that I have for you is, um, I'm just curious if um, this concept of tolerable sub-optimization shows up in resource-rich places. And so is it the case that even in resource-rich context, if say Black or Latinx students are primarily in the social sciences that even in resource-rich spaces, they end up having to deal with um, tolerable sub-optimization in ways that other parts of a university aren't. And then the final question is just um, the idea about coalition, coalition building as a way to advocate and just what are the challenges to that type of work? Um, and so those are um, sort of just like a few questions to get us started. And I, um, we have a few in the chat as well that we'll come to in a moment. Sure, um, I can take the question on endowments. Um, mm -hmm. It's a combination of, of sort of two things. One, more elite public universities more quickly adopted some of the financial investment strategies of private universities. Um, they were tapped into some sort of private equity networks and uh, basically started investing in ways that grew money fast uh, mm -hmm. before other universities. Um, and they were taking that model directly from private schools. There's actually a really great book coming out um, 
by one of my colleagues called Bangers in the Ivory Tower that explains exactly how this happens. Um, it's also, um, so it's the investment strategies and it's also um, very much who's attending the university. Um, once public schools realized that um, they were losing state appropriations, they started to basically start asking for money. Um, and this was not something that state schools previously did. Like, you know, in the 1970s, the University of California would never ask Californians and those who um, attended the school or alumni for money because the idea was that you were paying into it substantially through state appropriations. But once that stopped, public universities started asking and, you know, in the same way that privates did for money. And if you have a, a student body that's predominantly disadvantaged, they don't have family wealth. And they also, you know, once they graduate, still tend to have less access to financial resources to provide back to the institution. So the schools that were serving wealthier students immediately had, you know, more access to capital. Um, and thus you start to see this divergence as they start asking for money and investing in money and money different or in, um, in endowments differently. Um, your second question was about what would this look like in a more research, resource rich environment? Would you still see inequalities across campus? I mean, I have an answer, but I also don't want to cut out Kelly here. So did you want to jump in, Kelly? You got to unmute though. Here we go. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, just, I just wanted to add to the endowment that uh, UCR was really instructive. Um, in that Ray Orbach, the former chancellor of UCR, who we talk about in, in quite a bit of detail in the book, um, was at UCLA as, a, as an administrator for, for quite a long time before he came to UC Riverside. And he seemed to believe that, um, you know, part of it is, is sort of a matter of timing as well. So when he was at UCLA, he was part of sort of getting that endowment um, process going, uh, starting these large capital campaigns and, and sort of building it there. And, and it wasn't until he arrived at Riverside where he sort of brought this practice as well. So there was a sort of um, a sort of delay. And, and I think he, he was sort of hopeful that a campus like UCR would catch up. But I think for all the reasons that, that Laura's mentioned, um, that seems unlikely over the longer term. Um, in terms of you know something like tolerable suboptimization in a more resource rich environment, I think that um, you will see these similar sorts of practices. You'll see much more internal um, sort of uh, differences in how it's approached, but what a lot of this practice comes from is what we talk about in the book as an austerity logic. And so these austerity logics are that there simply aren't enough resources to go around, um, that resources have to be saved and that um, higher ed suffers from what Chris Newfield has referred to as a cost disease, right? And so what you will see is even in resource-rich environments, and, and I've uh, been in these resource-rich environments where um, the money simply appears to not be there. And so cost cutting is continually happening, even in these spaces where uh, resources seem um, much more abundant. And so that attitude, tolerable suboptimization, especially in the case of Riverside or in, in the case of Merced is, is very much, a, um, I guess, a, a reality of resource lack, its absence. Um, but it's also uh, a, a sort of, um, in other spaces, very much a mindset about how to run an organization. And so I think you will see it either by choice or necessity. Um, simply as, uh, as the culture of higher ed becomes so austerity focused. And so the third question that I ask you, um, uh, an, an attendee who works in enrollment management has actually asked a, ver a similar version. And so I had just asked you about like the challenges to coalition building. And so the attendee is asking about um, where you mentioned University of Michigan Flint um, and Dearborn in partnership with Ann Arbor. So that idea about the one university approach, um, but have either institutions received additional funding from Ann Arbor? And so is it more than just like, you know, say a front facing partnership around a one university idea, but are there any mechanisms where like the more resource rich university is financially supporting any efforts across the campuses. Um, and so just what are any potential plans for more equity that you may have come across in your work? 
Yeah, I'm the one you, not yet. <laughs> that is a really drawn out uh, massive political battle because there are a lot of folks on the Ann Arbor campus who aren't supportive of that initiative for, for reasons that you can imagine, right? I mean, this is always the issue with, with privilege um, that, you know, some folks are going to have to give, <laughs> you're going to have to give up some things. Like it's actually real in order to distribute things more equally. It might mean that you need to give up some things. Um, so that's been a pretty contentious battle. I think that it's easier in states where there is a larger interest in the state legislature um, in serving more equitably student populations and state legislatures vary on this there. I mean, there are state legislatures that are kind of like quite the opposite. In fact, you know, these are states where they're cutting, you know, ethnic studies programs and making it impossible to do critical race um, scholarship. So in California, I think we have a unique opportunity because the state legislature is at the moment, although not always historically, people don't always realize that, but at the moment more progressive and the UC system um, also has had this unique um, argumentation historically that all the campuses are so, you know, uh, equal or are supposed to be equal. And so in those kinds of systems, it's a lot easier to, to make arguments for racial equity. And we have seen uh, other campuses give up some stuff for, for UC Merced to build UC Merced. Um, it really takes a willingness for campus leadership to not always be focused on a competition, but rather saying, okay, I, you know, we can give here a little bit and that in the long run, we'll be better off if we work collaboratively. And I really believe that's true because state systems will break apart with everybody on their own trying to compete for private resources if there isn't uh, a working together, a shared interest in convincing the state that this is actually worth continuing to invest in. And that argument is much better and much stronger if you're talking to the leaders of all of the state campuses, right? So I think we're at that moment where I think we're gonna see some effective stuff happening, but we're also at that moment where you're starting to see stuff break apart too. Yeah, and I, I think that, um as Laura is, is sort of pointed to there, that um, the, the one real big threat to the coalition building is just that the flagships and the, and the much wealthier campuses are, are going to um, flirt with the idea of privatization. Um, and not they would see privatization as desirable over building a coalition, sharing resources. And, and so that I think has to be resisted. And, and I don't know where that resistance comes from, but I think that um, that would be a really sort of destructive process for for public higher education systems if it were to were to go ahead. Um, I guess I see here in the chat the next question is or in the Q and A is about federal mechanisms for funding. I'm sorry, if I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but I, I, I was very interested in this, and, and um, it is very attractive um, idea to have a federal mechanism for funding higher ed. Um, states uh, are as the, as, as Christopher points out, constrained in their ability to um, spend in, in terms of times of downturn. And, and so the, the federal government sh in that sense should be able to step in. I think um, it, it may not, I guess a, a stable mechanism might work, but we can also, I guess, look back to the um, sort of Cold War science model of higher education that many of these systems sort of grew large and very successful on where there was a great deal of federal funding, but that came through the, the sort of Cold War machine. There are other mechanisms to sort of funnel this federal funding into higher education. Um, we can think of the, the, the Green New Deal as a model, right, of really expanding radically state funding for a, a, a real sort of broad social program um, that can be a way of, of sort of channeling resources um, in the absence of a broader federal mechanism. Um, to deal with it. Moving away from the individual funding of students through tuition, I think is, is through financial aid is, is a, um, it would be a big first step, but uh, I don't know that we really have sort of thought about what would replace that. Um, the danger of 
of something like um, block granting from the federal government to higher education systems as in the welfare system, I don't think would be a, um, a, a useful model. The block granting is very much a, a has been a mechanism for welfare cuts um, and, and sort of reducing over time the amount of money that goes into, into state-based welfare systems. And so a block grant wouldn't necessarily work from the federal government uh, necessarily, but uh, Laura, maybe you have some thoughts about what might come in its place. Yeah, I, mean, I think Christopher's question is really, really good and that part of the problem here is that we've entirely shifted to a model in which individual students and families fund higher education and it creates like really perverse incentives <laughs> for universities um, to, for example, get more, grow, 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 or to bring in students that you can charge more money for. So non-resident students, um, international students, out-of-state students, um, or just to up the tuition, um, either out of necessity in some cases, um, or just as a means to, to increase tuition. So it creates these strange and perverse incentives. There was a moment, um, you know, the higher education, the HEA um, Act has been um, sort of reauthorized multiple times. And um, there have been these moments where there was a funding mechanism that was supposed to run through institutions directly to institutions instead of students, and they cut that. And then in 1992, um, basically the federal government made it easier for um, private lenders to get in the business of student loans, and then you have a student loan crisis after that. And so there have been a series of, of decisions that have been made that have shifted the burden and also made it made the business of student loan financing and getting students like very lucrative which made for profits for example really excited <laughs> about enrolling lots of students in a very predatory way and so that sort of whole chain of events is um is incredibly problematic i mean one solution of course is our various models of um uh you know free college is you know one possibility in that and i've done a, a bunch of analyses with some team members at my at uc merced um, and at princeton and we've shown that free college really would help address um, the racial wealth gap a little bit um, because it's black families in particular are um, don't quite have the, the family wealth that white families have to pay for college, and they're really taking a hit on this. So, you know, that's one federal mechanism to, to really change that part of the equation. Um, but in terms of stable funding for institutions, you would have to think about how to do it in a way that doesn't run into some of the issues that Kelly just mentioned. Well, I feel like that was the perfect question for us to end on. Um, and so, again, thank you so much for uh, not only just um, laying out the overview of your book and sort of the um, guiding principles of your research, but also the major findings, but also helping us to think about how your findings translate to us and giving that us uh, that language around the new university um, and what that what the challenges come and how we can actually try to meet those challenges head on in a planful perspective. So thank you both uh, for joining us. Um, it was lovely to have you and thank you for also engaging the audience and the attendees with the questions that they have. And everyone, thank you for joining us today. We hope you um, were able to learn something. We will be posting um, more of a condensed version of this on our website in a few weeks. And so please check that out at mbdiversity.ruckers.edu. Um, thank you all for attending and we hope you have a lovely evening.